Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the LSE for this online event on international climate politics after the US presidential election. This event is hosted by the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment and the US Center here at the LSE. My name is Robert Faulkner. I'm the research director of the Grantham Research Institute, and I'll be chairing this event together with Peter Trubowitz, the director of the US Center. We have just experienced one of the most extraordinary US elections, and indeed one of the most extraordinary presidential terms under Donald Trump. Despite various delays in the vote counting process and legal challenges by the Trump team, it seems clear that Joe Biden will become the 46th president of the United States in January. Biden has already announced that on his first day in the Oval Office, he will return the US to the Paris Agreement and his team are putting climate change and cl clean energy at the heart of their economic recovery program. Unsurprisingly, the Biden victory has created some excitement about the prospects of a renewed US engagement in the UN climate process. The timing could not be better for this as preparations are underway for the delayed COP26 conference, which will take place in the UK next year. But important questions remain. Can Biden back up his climate rhetoric with decisive legislative action in the United States? Can the US indeed provide credible international leadership after so many false starts in the past? And what about the fractured US-China relationship and its impact on future climate efforts? To discuss these and other questions, we have assembled a stellar panel of experts from both sides of the Atlantic. I'm pleased to welcome our four esteemed speakers to the LSE today, Anne-Marie Slaughter and Naomi Oreskes and Laurence Tubiana and Lord Nicholas Stern. I will introduce each speaker before their opening statement. The format for this webinar will be as follows. Our panelists will offer brief opening reflections on the topic of conversation. After that, we move into a panel discussion chaired by Peter Trubowitz, who will be fielding questions from the audience. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE climate politics. I should also mention that this online event is being recorded and provided there are no technical difficulties, we will hopefully make it available as a podcast. As usual, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to our panel. To submit your questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You can do this already uh, from the beginning of the event. Questions will then be submitted to the chairs and we will put as many questions as possible to the speakers. But do please let us know your name and affiliation. We're particularly keen, of course, to hear from LSE students and alumni. So please let us know. All right, I think it's time to get started. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Anne-Marie Slaughter. Anne-Marie is the CEO of New America, a think tank that works on a wide range of public policy challenges in the United States. During the Obama administration, she served as Director of Policy Planning for the US State Department from 2009 and to 2011. And indeed, she was the first woman to hold that position in the State Department. Prior to her government service, she was the Dean of Princeton University School of Public and International Affairs and the J. Sinclair Armstrong Professor of International Foreign and Comparative Law at Harvard Law School. Anne-Marie, thank you for joining us tonight and the floor is yours. Rob, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I love LSE and I'm particularly happy to be addressing uh, your many students who I hope are uh, in the virtual audience. Uh, it's a, a great day to be talking about these issues. What I'd like to do is to run down the things that we know a President Biden can do and probably will do, uh, and then talk about what we might hope if there's any daylight with a Republican Senate. Uh, for this, these purposes, I'm going to assume that, and then and then maybe broaden it out just to, just a bit to what he might do uh, on the civic side. So we, do, we know the first thing, of course, he is going to rejoin the Paris Agreement. He'll do that on his first day in office. Uh, he's also said that he will convene a global summit of leaders 
uh, to encourage greater emission, uh, emission cuts. Now, one would hope that he would coordinate that with the next COP. Uh, and I, I assume he will want to, to build on either after the COP or probably before. Uh, he will also want to rescind a whole raft of, of uh, Trump's executive orders. And these are things like, uh, actually, Trump rescinded uh, all the different federal agencies' climate plans. So if the State Department said it was cutting carbon emissions on travel, if uh, lots of different departments had plans, uh, Trump actually insisted they not have them, and that those can be put back in. Uh, and similarly, he can insist, or his administration can insist, uh, that the, um, the climate be part of any economic stimulus. So we, we should expect to see a big COVID relief plan. Uh, we should have actually seen one before the election, uh, but that is something I think that will go through. And the Biden administration can insist that that include lots of provisions for renewable energy, uh, lots of, of incentives uh, for people to actually invest their dollars, COVID relief dollars, uh, in, in climate friendly options. He can also, of course, issue new executive orders uh, to cut emissions in various ways. Uh, particularly interesting would be financial regulations uh, that require public companies to disclose uh, their carbon emissions, but also um, climate related finance risks, uh, which really does shift markets when that's something that companies have to uh, put in their uh, public disclosures. He can also revise rules on fossil fuel restrictions uh, and again, to, to create incentives or for renewable energy. And a lot of this is just rolling back the Trump anti-climate agenda. Uh, he can also prioritize environmental justice when he, there's going to be a lot of investment in both infrastructure and in equity on the domestic side. And both of those, green infrastructure, clean energy, but also trying to reduce pollution in poor communities. And finally, he can cut back, he can actually rescind uh, the orders that allow for oil drilling in the Arctic, which is in itself a huge thing. So those are things he can do just as, uh, as an executive, as president, without anything more. He could also reach out to China and propose some kind of climate partnership. This will be the space to watch. Uh, his top advisors have said they're gonna continue a tough line with China, but they also recognize areas of, comp of cooperation, necessary cooperation and climate is one. So that is something he could do on first power. Although if he wanted to back anything like that up uh, with an agreement uh, that has to go through the Senate, he's in the, in the same situation. Let's imagine we actually got a Democratic Senate, or I think more likely we get a Republican Senate, but with a number of senators who have, have incentives to actually get things done. Well, part of what will happen will depend on whether the filibuster is, if they keep the filibuster, which requires 60 senators, which is much harder to do. But it is probably the best thing we could hope for uh, would be to actually see a carbon tax passed with, a, with the dividends going back to the people. This is something a number of Republicans have put forward, Republican leaders, people like George Schultz and Henry Kissinger, but a whole lot of, of uh, other sort of prominent non-governmental Republicans saying they could agree to a carbon tax, but only if it has this, this dividend that goes back to the people. And finally, he... I mean, internationally, of course, he's going to sign the Paris Agreement. But I think he ought to think about the same day that he signs the Paris Agreement, announcing something like the Biden-Bloomberg Climate Coalition, where as president, he reaches out to the global covenant of mayors that the Bloomberg folks have put together, 7,000 mayors making commitments about energy and carbon emissions cuts around the world. Uh, and also a number of CEOs, university presidents, other folks in the civic and corporate space. If Biden wants to make something that he sure will last beyond his presidency, one of the best things he could do is to formalize 
those uh, work with those stakeholders, the non-party stakeholders in the Paris Agreement uh, to be an informal, but still informal at international law, but more formalized global coalition uh, that would outlast his presidency. And I'll leave it there. Wonderful, thank you so much, Anne-Marie. I'm now delighted to hand over to our second speaker, Laurence Tubiana. Laurence is the CEO of the European Climate Foundation. She has a long record of combining academic research with advising governments. In 2002, she founded the, and then directed the Paris-based Institute of Sustainable Development and International Relations, perhaps better known as IDRI. In 2015, Laurence was France's climate change ambassador and special representative for COP21, which led to the adoption of the landmark Paris Agreement, a treaty that she very much actively shaped. Following COP21, she was appointed high-level champion for climate action by the United Nations. Laurence, we're delighted you can be with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Robert. And again, very happy to be uh, uh, here at LSE with the students, my former colleagues, and many, uh, many fascinating speakers. I am honored to be to be talking to. And um, listening to, to Anne-Marie uh, and looking at the European perspective, I see, of course, a number of things where the announcement of Joe Biden in its climate platform, uh, of course, is resonate, of course, very well with the EU Green Deal. Not the name necessarily, because I understand Green Deal is a sort of different political sensitivity in US, but being net zero by 2050, um, having the clean energy, the power, clean power by 2035, um, stopping fossil fuel subsidies, uh, and even connection with the trade policies through uh, a potential carbon border tax adjustment. All these resonate, of course, very well with the EU, and in particular, what you said, Anne-Marie, meaning putting the, the green factor in the recovery, which is exactly what the Green Deal is about in Europe. So meaning the recovery has to be green, it has to be consistent with the net zero by 2050. All this, of course, and with a, of course a question mark of how uh, Joe Biden could uh, really uh, submit a new uh, 2030 target uh, uh, in, the, in the process is really important. But anyway, as you said, the combination of what is now the new global governance type around climate, which encompass not only the government plus non-state actors, the business, the financial community, everything resonates with the own organization of EU. The second element is, of course, what is a, an enormous relief, even if we are, of course, very anxious about what happened and we are absolutely curious about knowing how you see the, the following months uh, with, of course, the Republicans for the moment sticking to Trump, uh, how much the negative domino effect that Trump has generated with a number of countries, Brazil, Australia, even Mexico, just pushing back, uh, which now, the, and because of EU standpoint, very strong point, plus, of course, China uh, in September with the announcement of the net zero by 2060, and the South Korea and the Japan thing, the, the negative domino effect could absolutely will, I'm sure, uh, will be reversed in the positive sense, a, a building momentum uh, uh, before Glasgow because of US coming back. So this is really super positive. Again, it resonates, it's really putting the mechanism of Paris Agreement in place, the long-term strategies, the short-term, having the sectors, of pathways, mobilizing the stakeholders, and in particular the finance that we have this famous article to really putting the, fine, the, the private and the public finance in the green side. I do think this, and, and of course all the investment and, and, and will be positive, combined with the fact that uh, Biden America is not the Obama America f uh, eight years ago now, uh, when I thinking of the second mandate, well, the economy of America was not so progressive in terms of renewable energy, the crisis on coal, et cetera, et cetera. What my question are with this panel is how US come back to the scene. Uh, Joe Biden has announced, and with of course the advice of many of our friends, the, the convening of a, a major em emitters meeting at heads of state level, which of course is really interested, interesting, but at the same time, 
Joe Biden comes in a global scene, which is not the same one than four years ago. And the notion of more distributed leadership, which of course, what anyway, what people have to do because US was not there anymore, requires a certain way of uh, coming back, which of course is delicate for many reasons, you know my heart on your side. So how Joe Biden and the team is prepared to participate to a more distributed leadership, I can tell you already my friends at the EU level, both government and the commission are saying, will they want to replace everything? Uh, please not. How they would build the relation between EU and China? Does the pivot to Europe will, will really be there? And of course, contrary to the probably the, the previous democratic administration, how makes the trade policy a cooperation zone, not a conflict zone? So a number of questions, not so much about the fantastic positive impact that the election has and of course an enormous relief with of course all of our anxiety of what's how it will in a way be smoothly developed or not in the next weeks and months but really the way as uh, a notion of the kind of leadership that us could exert could could combine with others and and again it's practical things is a do uh, do the the new MEF will replace MOCA, do, do finally this Petersburg dialogue would not even be the place. And then the two elements, and I stop there, very important milestone, not only the COP in, in Glasgow, important, of course, very important, but the G7 and the G20, a probably different G20 now that China has shown its cards. And how the bilateral policy of Biden can increase this movement, play this positive domino effect, and make G7 and G20, in particular G20, places where climate was always, always uh, on the sidelines, be much more centered, maybe uh, around the green recovery. So this is more questions and answers, but again, uh, of course, as everyone is super happy what has happened in US and thank you for this gift to the world. Wonderful. Thank you, Laurence. Uh, very good questions indeed that we, I'm sure we will want to follow up in, in the later discussion. Um, I'm delighted now to hand over to our third speaker, uh, Naomi Oreskes, who is a professor of the history of science and affiliated professor of earth and planetary science at Harvard University. Naomi is a world-renowned geologist, historian, public speaker, and she's a leading voice on the role of science in society, especially in the fight against climate change. Among her many books, I'd like to highlight just one uh, volume entitled Merchants of Doubt, in which she shines a critical light on the corporate funded campaign to discredit climate science. Uh, the book has been turned into a fascinating documentary. In case you haven't seen it, you should. And I believe a new edition of the book is coming out later this year, which is a perfect, a perfectly timed uh, publication event. Naomi, thank you for being with us tonight and the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. And like everyone else, I'd like to just say it's, it's a pleasure to be with such wonderful speakers and to be here with the students at LSC. Um, and I should say, actually, the second edition of Merchants of Doubt actually came out last February, but it was right when COVID-19 was hitting and it got no attention whatsoever. So thank you for uh, making that plug. Uh, so, so I think I, I'd like to just start with a little bit of good news, because obviously this is a happy day. And thank you, Laurence, for that. Thank you. And uh, a lot of us worked hard and spent a lot of money on this election. So it is rewarding to see a positive outcome. Um, so it's a happy day here. It's been a happy weekend. Uh, so I thought what I'd start with a little bit of the good news and then do the thing that historians always do, which is to tell us, but uh, so obviously, uh, and also because climate change is, ha is and has been for such a long time a bad news story. One of the things that's hard about working on this issue is that it's a negative story. People don't like bad news and we struggle to find positive ways to explain to people why it's so important that we act on this issue. So the good news, obviously, I think everyone here knows Donald Trump has been an unmitigated, unqualified disaster on climate change. There is absolutely no silver lining uh, to the Trump presidency in this respect. Uh, we've seen a long history in the United States of conservatives, Republicans, and some sectors of the business community disparaging climate science, diminishing the significance of the issue but it took Donald Trump to say that it was a hoax and to be just to ridicule scientists and to ridicule the whole issue. And it's a huge relief to have that uh, mostly or hopefully entirely in our rear view mirror. And I think we do have to be very clear 
about what a complete and unmitigated disaster Donald Trump was. Um, so that's obviously good that that's, that's hopefully gone. Um, and also it's not just getting rid of Donald Trump though. Joe Biden is, I think, a great leader on climate. I think he's highly educated. I think we see the way in which he understands the issue profoundly. And he's already been made it clear that climate is going to be one of his top four priorities. As Professor Slaughter already mentioned, he's already committed to rejoining the Paris Agreement. And I think equally important, rejoining the World Health Organization because climate change doesn't stand alone. And it doesn't stand alone in a number of ways, but the two that I think are most important, at least from my perspective, is that the commitment to science, the commitment to reason, the commitment to evidence-based decision-making um, is something that cuts across many areas. And the denial of scientific evidence with respect to COVID-19 in the past four years has of course been part and parcel of the denial of scientific evidence of climate change. So the re-embrace of international science, of global scientific organizations, is hugely important. And I think rejoining Paris and rejoining WHO, uh, we can think of it as rejoining Paris and Geneva, two wonderful French speaking cities, is really, really important and not to be, not to be dismissed. I also think it's extremely important that Joe Biden has now has Kamala Harris as his vice president. And I say that largely not because Harris comes out of a very strong background in climate. She doesn't, but because she comes from California. And California has consistently been a leader in the United States in climate change, in environmental protection, and in science and evidence-based decision-making. And I think she comes out of an, an environment where there are proven, tested policy instruments that we know can work. And in my own experience talking to the American people, it's very important to have these examples. So for example, California was a pioneer in the use of emissions trading to control air pollution in Southern California. This is a little known fact, but even before we had emissions trading for acid rain, we had emissions trading for air pollution in Southern California and it worked and it didn't cost jobs and it didn't damage the economy. In fact, the opposite. What we've seen consistently in California since the 1960s, so for more than six decades, is that sensible environmental policy goes hand in hand with a growing, thriving, creative job generating economy. And so California puts lie to the false dichotomy that the right wing has promoted for so long that we have to choose between jobs and the economy. Uh, we do not, and California proves that. And so having Harris, who's familiar with the California situation, um, who took over the attorney general's office after a, you know, a long history of great attorney generals there, including Jerry Brown, um, I think that's really encouraging and important. And as Professor Slaughter said, there's a lot that uh, the president can do, uh, even if he doesn't have a supportive Congress. But that, of course, brings us to the bad news. Um, we all know that politics is all about coalitions. And right now, I think it's going to be very challenging to figure out what the coalition is that moves this issue forward in the United States. Um, Professor Slaughter talked about how there are some Republicans who have been sympathetic to the idea of market-based mechanisms to address climate change, and that's true. But it's also true that despite, um, despite a lot of conversation about it, what we've consistently seen over the last 30 years is that when we ever get close to doing it, it somehow doesn't happen. It somehow slips through our fingers and it feels like a bit of a false promise, maybe even a Trojan horse in some cases. So I think we have to be really, really cautious about assuming that there are reasonable Republicans who will get on board so long as we uh, promote market mechanism. I think the history of the last 20 years makes us need to be very cautious about that. And we saw just this weekend, uh, Mitt Romney, who many people have had a lot of hope about. We know that Mitt Romney was a progressive governor when he was here in Massachusetts. Uh, we know that his own staff have been talking for several years now to many people about this issue. We know that he's educated on the issue. We know that he understands the scientific evidence. And yet this weekend, even Mitt Romney, one of the few uh, Republicans to accept that Joe Biden will be our next president said on television, well, conservatives have to continue to fight against the Green New Deal and fight against the continued use of oil, gas and coal. Now the Green New Deal piece, that's okay. I mean, that's a policy position and obviously Republicans and Democrats are going to disagree on policy, but to say that we have to fight to continue to use oil, gas and coal, 
is profoundly problematic. And I think we have to take on board that that is what we are up against, even among you know, the moderate, so-called moderate Republicans. Um, I also wanted to say one other thing um, about the US situation, and then one quick comment about the international situation. I also saw on television this morning, Tim Ryan, moderate Democrat, in general, I think a good guy in a lot of ways. Again, definitely knows that climate change is a real issue. But he said on CNN that we had to protect the million jobs in the gas industry, millions of jobs, that was his word. Well, there are not millions of jobs in the gas industry. According to the US Department of Labor, there's about 150 to 160,000. So even our allies, even people on our side have bad statistics, have wrong information about this issue. The green energy economy is the fastest growing sector of the US economy right now. And even our allies don't know that. So we have a lot of work to correct misperceptions on that. And so I think it's going to be very difficult to build an effective coalition here in the United States. And we really have to think harder and smarter about it. And that leads to the question of the role that the US can play in this issue. And here again, I think we have to be, you know, we want to be optimistic and obviously we need a certain amount of optimism to keep us working, but we also have to have our eyes wide open. And I think it's very unlikely, and I might be wrong, I hope I am proven wrong, but I think it's very unlikely that the United States is going to be an effective leader on this issue, at least for the next few years, because of how difficult the situation is here at home. But it's not just that. People like to talk about the US being a leader, offering leadership, but the US has always been a reluctant partner on climate, always. If you go back to 1992, when world leaders were meeting in Rio de Janeiro, George H.W. Bush, who we now in hindsight think of as being pretty good on this issue compared to what came next, almost didn't go to Rio because there was so much opposition among his own advisors. And even though he finally did go to Rio, and even though the US did sign the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, at the same time, he made a big speech in which he said, the American way of life is not up for negotiation. And I think that remains one of our biggest challenge, that Americans feel, rightly or wrongly, that acting on climate challenges the American way of life. And until we can find out some way to, to convince them that that's not true and to paint a positive vision of a great American way of life based on renewable energy uh, and efficiency, I think we can do that. But I think until we do, any American leader is going to have trouble being an effective leader on this issue. Wonderful. Thank you, Naomi, for that real reality check. Um, we desperately need that as we move forward. Um, last but not least, I'd like to welcome our fourth speaker, Lord Nicholas Stern. Nick holds the IG Patel Chair of Economics and Government at the LSE, and he's also the chair of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. Nick has combined a distinguished career in academia with public service at national and international levels. Um, everyone will know that when he was serving in the British government, he produced the now famous Stern Report on Climate Change back in 2006, which had a lasting impact on how governments view the costs of action or inaction on climate change. He continues to advise governments on climate policy around the world, from China to the UK, and he's advising the British government also on the forthcoming COP26 conference. Nick, thank you so much for being with us tonight, and uh, you have the last word in this first round. Thank you. Uh... Robert and I have always already enjoyed very much seeing my good friends uh, uh, on on screen and listening listening to very thoughtful comments. Um, I want to talk about the world economy with COVID because we live obviously in a very different world uh, from a year ago, and that will profoundly affect the whole story and set of discussions around uh, climate action. Then I'll say a little bit about the UK and if I've got any and COP. And if I've got any time left, I'll say something about India, um, India being so, so important in and of itself, but also as the biggest uh, developing country outside uh, China, uh, um, embodying the, a lot of the issues around uh, climate and development. But first, let me say, and I echo what others have said about the difficulty of the US uh, coming back in a, a world that has not stopped over the last four years. And we have made remarkable progress over the last four years, um, particularly the last two or three, notwithstanding the occupants of the White House. If you look at the number of countries committed to net zero 
and committed to what they're going to do in the next decade. It's the two of the things, of course, net zero by 2050 and the coming decade, and we have to put the two of those together. But we have um, the UK, the EU, China, uh, Japan, Korea, many, many other countries committed to uh, net zero, and all that in the last couple of years, or actually in the last year or so. So many firms around the world committed to net zero. Um, some of the major Indian firms, um, Reliance, led by Mukesh Ambani, committed to net zero by 2035, Dalmia Cement by 2040, Mahindra by 2040, um, Tata's very committed. Now, I just named the Indian firms because you know about all the others from you know, Microsoft to Walmart and Unilever and, uh, and so on. All that in the last two or three years. It shows that the world has not stood still. So the United States is coming back, as it were, into a different environment, an environment that has moved. Now, having the UK, sorry, having the, the US as changing from being a real obstacle to being something that's much more friendly is enormously important. But it'd be very wrong to pretend that whilst it was out, everything stopped. That absolutely isn't true. Of course, I don't want to get overwhelmed with optimism because however fast we're moving, it's far, far too slow. But we have to recognize that momentum is there. The world out there, of course, uh, not out there, the world we are in uh, everywhere is a world where there's a deep, deep recession from COVID. So the story now is not simply combining uh, growth and climate responsibility and employment. And we've argued for a long time, correctly, in my view, that you could do that. Naomi emphasized the uh, Californian example, but there are quite strong examples in Europe too, including the uh, UK. Uh, it's more than that now. We would argue, I hope, uh, persuasively, eventually, and eventually has to be pretty soon, that a sustainable recovery is a strong recovery. If you want a strong recovery, go to things which are fast in implementation, labor intensive, and have strong economic multipliers, often measured through low import content. What do you get? Restoring buildings, um, sorry, refit, retrofitting buildings to make them more energy efficient, um, building out broadband, building out uh, charging facilities for electric vehicles, making cities more friendly to uh, cyclists and pedestrians, restoring degraded land, doing, make, you know, build it, the, the reforestation, looking after our uh, waterways, a whole collection of activities, fast, labor intensive, strong economic multipliers. So there's a further story, which is fundamental, that we have to have a strong recovery given the desperate state of the world economy. And the sustainable route is the best way to do that. And make no mistake, we're really in a hurry on this. Our unemployment is absolutely global, on top of, of course, the medical uh, emergency, children out of school around the world. We are running into a, a lost decay for development unless we act very quickly. And that background is fundamental to all the COP26, let me switch there to the COP26 in the UK. We have to see COP26 as set in the context of desperately needing a global recovery and pushing forward, avoiding this lost decade in development, showing that the climate and development story uh, are, are move hand in hand. It's not a spitting contest between artificial horse race between one and the other. And that we have to show now and that, it seems to me, is going to be so important in the interactions that there will be between different countries around COP26, including, of course, the richer countries and the poorer countries. So it, the UK, I think, is deeply committed. I, I didn't know when this government came in how deeply committed it would be. I now believe that is the case. Just today, we had the chance of the Exchequer announcing the first... Uh, green gilts from the, U, from the UK. The Prime Minister will give a speech in about a week or so with a 10 point plan of action around um, the drive to net zero as the growth story for the, uh, for the UK. Um, 
this, uh, we didn't know uh, really when this government came in, but I'm now convinced, you know, working reasonably closely with them, that that commitment is, is genuine. It is something that the UK wants to build in terms of global Britain. We're redefining ourselves. I mean, many of us were desperately unhappy about Brexit, uh, but the challenge is to redefine a global Britain. And if we're going to do that, then what are we going to lead on? Well, um, and we like to think our universities are very good and all that, and we like the BBC, but what are we going to lead on? We're both going to lead at all in international relations on climate. That golden opportunity is there. And it coincides with the G7 presidency this coming year. And it's good fortune that it's Italy and the G20 this coming year. And we are the co-presidents, Italy and UK and the COP. Following that, G7, Germany, and G20, India. There's a real chance now, and we're discussing it intensively in the UK, of having that two years of sanity in G7, G20, as building towards something very strong. And personally, I'm working directly with the government on sustainable recovery as the key issue for uh, the G7 presidency in the UK. All those reasons put together make me convinced that the UK wants to do something strong on, uh, on, on the COP. Now, we know that just having a strong presidency is not enough, although Laurent showed us just how important it could be having a strong presidency uh, of the COP. The last thing is India. And let me just very briefly illustrate what I had in mind about collaboration. Uh, India is looking for infrastructure investment uh, of something like $1.4 trillion over this next five years. Seven, eight percent a year uh, devoted to infrastructure investment in India. Uh, the telephone call that um, President Modi put through to Barack Obama during the Paris Agreement in the, the first week of that Paris discussion was about the cost of capital. He said, look, it's really difficult for us to invest strongly in the kind of infrastructure we need if we're paying eight or nine percent real for infrastructure investment. So that is going to be an absolutely key part of the story. How can we collaborate? How can we work as a world to bring down the cost of capital? We should be able to do it because the you know, interest rates are on the floor or below the floor. They're uh, negative. But it's translating that, handling the risk that feeds in to kick up so strongly the cost of capital. There's a lot we can do working with the multilateral institutions on that, releasing the special drawing rights for the IMF. I mean, two shots of 500 billion is what we need from the IMF, expanding the ability to lend at the international institutions. All that can be done. And it, it, it's something which I think a, a Biden leadership really could, uh, could make possible. Of course, India is concerned about technology and India wants to be a leader in the 21st century. And we should reach out. India should be, is becoming already a re leader in the 21st century. And a G7, G20 collaboration over these next two years could help that major important political process along. Technology is vital. Mission innovation, UK and India are part of that story in, uh, in Paris. There's so much more we can do. At Davos, the first thing that the first Indian minister I met, Piyush Goel, said to me was, how do we bring down the cost of clean air conditions? There are so many things we can do together. There's enormous possibility in um, in green cold storage, which would really obviously powered by zero carbon electricity, which would radically reduce food waste. There's so much we can do. Prime Minister Modi has declared big programs in restoring degraded land. If the world gets together around finance and technology, around international leadership, where the uh, developing nations are the leaders, not the followers on this, we can transform that uh, discussion. But unless we do it in a way that puts the world recovery and development uh, at centre stage. It doesn't make a lot of sense just to talk about the COP. Great. Thank you all for that's a terrific set of opening comments. I know there's going to be a lot of questions. We've got about we have over 500 people on the platform. Uh, with us while we wait for these questions to roll in. I can see they're rolling in. Let me, let me kick off the discussion with, with a couple of 
questions, one for our two guests from uh, across the pond, uh, Emory Slaughter and Naomi Oreskes, and, and then one for um, Laurence Tubiana and, and, and Nick Stern on this side of the Atlantic. To Anne-Marie and, and Naomi first. So I think the vast majority of people on this platform, I'm guessing, felt a huge sense of relief on Saturday. Uh, when all the major networks called Pennsylvania for Biden to put him over the top in the Electoral College. And still, as it was reflected in your, your opening comments, we all know that America remains a deeply divided country, including over climate. You know, according to a recent Pew poll, 60% of the US public now views climate change as a major threat, which is up from about 44% a decade ago, but it's mostly driven, as you know, by change, changing views among Democrats. Um, while 88% of Democrats consider climate change a grave threat, only about 31% of Republicans feel the same way. And I guess so the question here is, what can be done on the US side to make climate change a less partisan issue, to detoxify it in a way. I mean, what can Biden do to win over Republican supporters for, let's say, uh, you know, for his ambitious climate policy? And I'm, I'm struck by the the both of you pointed to, um, and Marie, you talked about the possibility of the a Biden Bloomberg coalition and you know working with cities not only in the United States but it seemed to me that an idea of instead of kind of you know in a sense going over the heads of of Congress but going down to the city level um, and perhaps pressure coming up from bot from the bottom um, and and Naomi you talked about the the need to create new kinds of coalitions. And I'm, I'm wondering if there are policies or policy areas where climate can be connected in a way that doesn't create a lot of negative externalities. You know, there is talk on both sides of the aisle about industrial policy in the United States. Even Marco Rubio has been talking about that. And so this goes to the idea of peeling off some of these Republicans and connecting them, but to pick up on, on Nick's point, doing it around something that is not much broader than climate, but that somehow where climate can be embedded in it. So some thoughts about that on, on, the, on the partisan divide and dealing with that. We need to unmute you, Anne-Marie. There's a lot there. I think Nick put his finger on the critical issue, which is that Democrats have got to own the idea that green is the path to growth, sustainable growth. But, but the Democrats have somehow allowed the Republicans to be seen now as the party of workers and jobs. At, at least rhetorically, whether they deliver or not is something else. But if you look at what people say on both COVID and climate, the Democrats are seen as wanting some restrictions, constraints, shutting down, stopping, all of which is going to hurt the economy and jobs. And that is not a winning message. <laughs> Go back to it's the economy, stupid. It's, it's not a winning message even among lots of minority uh, communities who, and if you look at why 38% of Latino men voted for Trump, that one of the biggest arguments was he will allow us to provide for our families. And yet nothing could really be further from the truth as Nick laid out. I mean, <laughs> The best way to get really good jobs across this country is to build an entirely new green infrastructure. And they're very simple things like putting, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it, it takes a lot of money, but putting all of our, our energy and power lines underground. Every time we have a stronger storm, people are out of power. 
for five days, right? <laughs> there's a lot of low hanging fruit and then there's building smart roads. I mean, we have to rebuild our entire infrastructure. So really uh, Biden, and I think he, he's well placed for this because he's the, you know, the man from Scranton, the hard scrabble, he gets what workers feel. He has got to continually align the idea that really embracing a new green infrastructure is how we rebuild our economy and how we deliver good, well, well-paid jobs uh, and and a and a sustainable long-term economy. Right, Naomi, thoughts on this? You're on mute. All of our guests should unmute. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree with that completely. You know, real estate agents always say there's only three things that matter in real estate, location, location, location. Uh, I think that in American politics, it's jobs, jobs, jobs. And I was also thinking about James Carville. I mean, I've been watching American politics for six decades now. I came from a very politically oriented family. So even as a child, we were arguing politics at the dinner table. And I think James Carville is the smartest political strategist we've seen in our lifetimes. And he was right, it's the economy stupid. And if we look at the post election focus groups from 2016, from 20, uh, you know, 20, I can't even, I'm so tired, I can't subtract four, 2012, 2008. I mean, it's always the same thing when people are worried about jobs, when they're worried about paying their bills, they get nervous. And when they get nervous, they become susceptible to the disinformation that the Republican party tells them. So I think that that has to be the strongest message about the green economy, green jobs, green growth, green development, green prosperity, green wealth. And I mean, wealth is green, right? This shouldn't be that hard a message, right? Money is green. And if somehow we can get a clearer message about that, then I think this is a totally winning issue for Democrats. And I also, the only other additional thing I would add is, you know, there's already, of course, a lot of, you know, all the pundits have come out and the chattering classes all have an opinion, uh, which is, of course, to be expected. Um, but there's a lot of talk now going on about how we have to make nice with the Republicans and make nice with our enemies. And I just, I've been thinking a lot about FDR. I'm doing some research right now on the history of some of the political issues around rural electrification in America and you know how uh, FDR did rural electrification. And, you know, as I said at the start, politics is about coalition. We have to always be thinking about who are the parties with whom we can make common cause, even if we may disagree on many other things, and that's fine. But I think one of the other big lessons from FDR, who was, after all, the greatest Democratic president probably ever, um, you know, he always said famously about his enemies, you know, I welcome their hatred, right? <laughs> which is really a shocking comment and not one that most of us feel that comfortable with. But the point he was trying to make, I think, is that you have to understand politics. There will be people who hate you and there will be people who you cannot reach. And that's okay, as long as you can build a majority coalition. And I think the Democrats have that totally within reach. I mean, most Democrats are on board on this issue. Most independents are on board on this issue. There's a hard core of right-wing people, uh, many of whom have explicit links to the fossil fuel industry. And I believe that actually those people do have to be isolated. I think the American people have to be taught and have to be shown that these people do not represent their interests. And we, you know, if we had more time, I could give you lots and lots of concrete examples. But, you know, I, I draw a lot in my work on parallels with the tobacco industry. And we faced a very similar problem where the tobacco industry insisted that if tobacco was controlled, you know, the economy of the South would fall apart. And of course, that didn't happen. It was a big lie. The economy of North Carolina is so much better, so much more diverse, so much more robust now than it was when it was a you know, a one commodity uh, state when all they had was tobacco. So, you know, these are big lies, but they work and it's always hard to counter a lie and you have to be creative and you have to be smart, but green money, I think is kind of where it's at. Okay, um, that's great. I've, I've got a question for um, Nick and Laurence. Actually, I have a bunch of them, but I can see now we're getting a lot of questions coming through from the audience. I want to go back to a point that Robert raised at the very outset about geopolitics, which is not figured into the discussion so much um, up to this point. I mean, there is a very, Anne-Marie alluded to this, but it, uh, there's a, a very good chance that um, 
that relations between Beijing and Washington, they're, they're obviously very bad right now. Tensions got worse under Trump. It didn't start though with Trump. And, and there are reasons to think that that relationship is gonna be very difficult going forward. And I guess the question here is how much of a concern is that tension, that rivalry between the United States and China for the future of what you know everybody wants to get done on on international climate change, or how does one begin to navigate that? And in a sense, what role can Europe play in helping the international community navigate that? I don't know who wants to, whether either one of you want to pick it up, and I'm happy to open this up more generally too. Laurence? Uh, I, I can start. I'm sure Nick has very so converging view because we are talking about that all the time in a way. Uh, maybe um, for us a little bit thinking about how EU has played recently, again, particularly on the climate policy side and the green recovery side, um, which in a way resonate, but in a way has, has in a way make a, a big move internationally being much more clearer that whatever happens, the Green Deal will be implemented, including if necessary with trade measures. And this uh, whole economy uh, uh, project, it's not a climate project, it's a industry, it's competition, it's state aid, it's transition, it's everything. And you see it resonates, including in the, in the more, within the more reluctant countries that were finally very close to China, in particular in the 17 plus one, arena where China was trying to, in a way, cut the Europe in two, um, really working the Eastern countries. This is not over, of course, but it's past. And I, what I noticed recently, of course, because um, um, whatever the analysis that the leadership of China made about US elections, they didn't want to wait for the US election to come back and say, this is our, our announcement even where many things has to be precise and, and of course the nature of the shorter term. Uh, talking to many Chinese friends these days, they, they begin to say a little bit more than there will be elements in the 14 fiber plans that show the direction of travel. They are now in a, in a, in a, in a view that uh, they, they can outperform on some on the clean sectors, automotive uh, industry in particular, because they feel that the, the, the century of the electrification of transport will be Chinese more than anything else. I think they, they, they had a new push on clean power, on clean infrastructure, with, with a lot of contradiction, of course, because the coal pipeline is still high, but that's a matter of probably, a, in a way, positioning and negotiation in the next months to come. So, um, you have a, 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 a Europe who has said, whatever happens, I'll do it. That has created the move on China, on, on my view, because again, looking at what the von der Leyen, the president of the commission, asked Xi Jinping in July, and, and of course he didn't respond immediately, but that was a consistent response to what von der Leyen was asking for. So how much, so then the, the question, when I remember my good friends on the US side uh, around Obama, they they discarded totally EU in the system. It was not. It was sort. Of, it was just the, the companion you don't you don't care so much about because they were they taken for granted, and and of course the, the big push for with the discussion the bilateral discussion was very strong. Now it's different one because uh, the solution to get out of the diplomatic isolation that maybe China is feeling critiques on BRI, internal critics as well as external, the problem of debt uh, Nick referred to, which is of course uh, the debt, the global debt, in particular, most developing countries are indebted to China, not to anybody else. Uh, so all this uh, makes a move of China to, to try to find more companion is, is now a, a set. And they will try to go discussion with US together with EU, at least at the, the last discussion we had recently with some of the advisors of Xi Jinping, even this morning. So that is a, a given. 
do can Europe make a sort of a transaction, play a transactional role? Uh, can climate be the place where everybody cooperates, even if there is many, many conflicts around, maybe in a way, but as listening to Naomi, of course, uh, it's strange and interesting that uh, the US always reclaims this climate leadership when every time it drops down, every time. 1992 was, but 1997 after, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not the first time. So maybe now, uh, in a way, that the, the ball is it just different. So again, I would say that what could be a good proof of, so the relation with Beijing, I think, will have, and whatever we think, a relation with EU, and it's delicate. That's why I was arguing uh, around the friends, uh, around Joe Biden team, that he could consider seriously talking to Europe first, but I don't know that he will be the case. Uh, and again, that will be a pivot to the traditional foreign policy and, and Marie and Naomi knows better even than of course myself. I would say that if he does that, then the triangle with China can work. And that's why I felt G20 was so important. Nick said rightly that the Indian are now reconsidering their position on climate because they feel that they cannot left, leave China alone on, on that scene. And then we have the G20 and the Italy, of course, the conversation apparently are going quite well between Modi and, and the Italian prime minister on that particular point. Meaning it's a very diverse world. And uh, that's interesting. I, I will fascinate to see what uh, traditional hegemon pivot to something different. We, I remember leading from behind from Obama president see very criticized so many 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 questions question but i do think that it would be a very interesting game uh but again as i see it even on trade we could have a very interesting discussion on how much we can compare the implicit carbon price in the different economies and try maybe to have some kind of agreement of a, not the formal club maybe some economists are looking for i don't believe in it really but but really uh, something that say we are working in the same direction and there is a virtuous competition not a negative one right nick you want to come in on this before we open it up to i've, I've got a list of questions from students and others but some thoughts Yes, and uh, I, I fully agree with Laurence, as she said, we, we talk about this all the time. But I think there is a world here that has fundamentally changed. And it's not simply that the UK is a world leader who took four years off and it just picks up again. Um, the world has moved on and it has been moving on for a long time. And I think a world which uh, has uh, the US, China, EU and India at center stage is a world that's with us. Uh, India will, of course, um, have some catching up to do, but let's not underestimate it. In larger measure on a number of dimensions, it's already part of that big uh, story. And we have to think of international politics that way. It's not just a G2 story where one of the G2 disappeared for a while and then it comes back again. Um, how do you make that kind of thing work? Um, I think around common interest. So there are three things which are uh, very clear. There's world health and the whole pandemic story, and this is not the last one, as, as we know. There's the world economy, which really is in a bad way. And China, for example, has everything to gain from a vibrant recovery around the world as a big, big trading nation. There's the debt slice of that. If you have disorderly debt, everybody gets caught. And China as a big uh, creditor now um, is, has a very strong interest in an orderly debt management of a very difficult debt situation. So there's world demand and there's world debt and there's a common interest that we all share in boosting the demand and sorting out the debt. And there's climate. So there's three very big areas where we know we're mutually dependent 
And mutual dependence, I hope, is good for collaboration. But you have to recognize the nature of the independence. And you have to recognize some ways out of it that you can all get behind. But there I do see tremendous opportunity from just a cheerful, positive approach of recognizing the problems and recognizing the ways forward and how we work together. And so positivity here, and we're seeing it already in Europe, and we're seeing bits of it in China, it needs to be encouraged. Um, and I hope we'll see it from uh, Biden. I do think we're beginning to see it from India. So it's nurturing, cultivating, building that positivity, some of it with personal relationships, some of it with real resources and coordinated policies. There's a, we can do, we can do well, and we can do really badly. And if we do really badly, we're in for a very, very tough time. Uh, that's uh, terrific. And Marie, I, I saw that you want to come in on this question, and then we'll, we'll go to audience questions. Go ahead. Thanks. It's a guarantee that my mail will drop every time I'm on a Zoom. Uh, so I just want to say quickly to, in, in response to Nick that you're seeing a, a real tension here between global politics and great power competition. If I wear my global power, uh, global politics hat, I, I see exactly what you see. China has a great economic incentive. The United States has a great economic incentive, and that goes in the right direction for climate. And there really should be a continuation of the policy we pursued for 40 years, where China's rise was actually good for us. That's great for, for, for those of us who are thinking about global issues. Then, but then you flip to what I think of as kind of the chessboard world, and it's all about we in China are locked in this new, you know, new Cold War, new great power competition. So we have to really think also about how to push back uh, between the global agenda and the, the great power agenda. That's great. Yeah, so, I, I very much agree with, with that, Peter. And if yeah. you can find one or two dimensions on which you can collaborate cheerfully, it might make the dimensions where it's not so easy to collaborate <laughs> cheerfully a bit warmer. Yeah. And that's, uh, where, where warm is a positive. Yeah. Yes, that, that's excellent. So let me bring in a couple of, we have over 40 questions in the, in the Q&A. So I'm going to I'm going to give a, I'm going to lay out three of them here very quickly. Um, one comes from Kim Jacobson, uh, and it actually there are several questions on this topic. It's been alluded to, but I think it would be useful to uh, hear um, hear more on it. Uh, what is the role of banks in enabling a greener economy? So a very short but huge question, and. Um, a second question um, comes from Felipe Sanchez of the Stockholm Environment Institute. This is somebody who's paying a lot of attention to uh, American politics. To what extent do the panelists see Trump's judicial appointments legacy at various levels as a risk to US climate action? Um, Anne Marie is the lawyer on here. Maybe we can ask you to start with that when we when we pick that up. And then a question from Ed Davey that actually echoes other questions that are coming in. Uh, this one begins by thank, thanking uh, us for the fantastic contributions from this panel. What role for nature, conservation, better agriculture, and land use being good ways of brokering bipartisan consensus and action in a Biden presidency, and I think just more generally in terms of international climate. So three very good questions pulling us in, in different directions. Um, somebody want to pick up the banks? Nick, would you be interested in, in, in Laurence and in running with the banks maybe? And um, uh, go ahead. It, 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 it's potentially huge, so I, I, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, Banks are about uh, managing risk. Uh, they, they have to look after people's assets. The cost of capital is uh, about risk. And I think more and more we're seeing banks recognize that to pursue the technologies and activities of the 19th and 20th century in a 21st century, which is changing very quickly, 
is bad banking. It is uh, to embrace risk. Uh, it is not looking after people's money well. And I think that uh, perception of where to lend money, how to lend money, how to manage risk well, how to look forward, how to get good customers, people who worry about where their pension savings are going to go. I think more and more banks are understanding that. The Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, um, set up uh, originally by uh, Mark Carney, uh, working with Mike Bloomberg, I think is getting increasing traction so that that recognition that uh, the old technologies and activities are very risky, that I think is feeding into more and more into reporting and regulation as well. So the banks are changing. I actually think that the financial institutions now are becoming a remarkable force for change. The multilateral development banks have a role to play, which is very important here too. Uh, but let me not develop that because there are other very big questions there. Just briefly on the consumer, the citizen element, which I think is important to bring back in that conversation in a way. I think uh, you remember the bad reputation of banks after the 2008 crisis and, and how sensitive they are now on how they, port they are portrayed in the public and the transparency, of course, that Nikki referred to through TCFD has brought a lot of attention of the public, of NGO and the civil organization on what the really the real action of the banks are. And I think that's a powerful drive for MOVE. I was just reading that the Scottish wind, uh, Widows Fund has decided to drop uh, almost 500 million pounds in uh, equity into um, companies that are failing ASG. This is a, now a menace, a threat that the financial community is feeling. And I think that's why I think uh, the citizen element, the consumers element, the visibility, transparency plays such a big role. And that you translate into many, many more investors and portfolios making trajectory to net zero by 2050. And, and that's a remarkable to the two last years, as Nick was mentioning. Great. And Marie, what about the, the Supreme Court Judicial Trump's judicial appointments in general. I mean, you know, if Biden is going to be forced probably to rely a lot on executive orders, and so these are going to be end up being contested in the courts. I'm not talking about rolling back the ones that Trump put in, but new ones and that likely will be tested in the courts. Where, where do you come down on this? What are your thoughts? So it's a good question because a, a lot of Trump's appointees, all of them really are pro-business, anti-regulatory, and that, that's something we pay much less attention to in, in judicial confirmation than we do the big social issues like guns or, or abortion. Uh, so it is certainly possible uh, that where, when it comes to, to new regulations, indeed, just to follow up on, on Nick Stern's point, if he wants to require all companies uh, to disclose fi uh, climate related financial risk uh, on their balance sheets, that which could play a really big role in terms of whether banks will lend to them with all sorts of, of uh, investment decisions. Uh, that's the that would require regulation. And yes, it's quite possible at the very least to delay regulations forever because there's notice and comment there are all these procedural hurdles and judges who don't want them to pass can can indeed delay them i think though the 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 for the longer term the real issue here is what is the position of business and it's not at all clear to me indeed as we were hearing who's what are the businesses that are already pledging net zero Obviously, you know, our carbon businesses don't like this, but where are they in the larger landscape of American business? Uh, and there, I, I do think you're seeing a shift quite quickly. Uh, and so that may change the position of pro-business anti-regulatory judges. But I think it's a good question and it is definitely a factor in whether Biden can get an, a full climate agenda through. Naomi, I'm wondering if you would be interested in picking up this question about coalition building around nature, conservation, better agriculture and land use. Any possibilities for that in the United States? 
Are you with yeah, us? Yeah, sorry, I just had to unmute. My computer keeps doing <laughs> weird things. I can't find the little the little arrow to unmute. Uh, yes, I think there are tremendous opportunities here, and I think we're seeing it already. So I work with an NGO in America, uh, a small NGO, but we like to think we punch it above our weight called Protect Our Winters. Mm -hmm. And public lands has been a really great issue for us. Uh, we have found that we are able to mobilize a much wider range of people on the issue of protecting public lands than you might otherwise associate with what you know we typically call environmental issues. Uh, so Protect Our Winters was founded by a professional snowboarder, Jeremy Jones, who saw with his own eyes how climate change was hurting the snow fields that he depended on for his livelihood. And the message is a message to uh, hunters and fisher people, men and women, uh, climbers, skiers, ice climbers, snow and builders, anyone who spends time outdoors, anyone who loves public lands, anyone who appreciates the national parks, which it turns out is a huge, huge number of Americans. We have a slogan, we have a, a program we call the Outdoor State. We have 50 million Americans who spend time outdoors and say that being outdoors is important to them. And during the COVID-19 crisis, that number has increased dramatically. That's a lot bigger than the NRA. That's, you know, if we could mobilize those 50 million people, that would be a force to reckon with. So I think this is a, a, is a really winning issue. And then if you bring in agriculture and food, that gets a little trickier. Um, because the issues around meat eating are tricky. And then you get, I mean, one good thing about the public lands thing is we also have the potential. I don't think it's been tapped nearly as well as it needs to be, but the potential to get industry involved because outdoor recreation is a multi-billion dollar industry that employs millions of people. Uh, it's a big, big part of the economy, especially in a number of the Western states. When we don't get snow, Utah suffers. So I think outdoor activity is, a winning issue, but food gets a little trickier, right? You get into that territory where the Republicans say, you're trying to take away my hamburgers. So I do think food is important. And we know that emissions related to agriculture are very important. We are seeing more mobilization on that issue. I think the messaging around food is a little trickier. Um, so right now I'm doing the outdoor land stuff, but I totally love and support all the people who are working on food. Okay, great. Look, we've got, it. We've got some other terrific questions. Uh, here we have a lot. We're over 50 at this point. Um, I want to I want to pick up um, and and we uh, Naomi, you asked, can I see these questions afterwards? And the answer is yes. So um, they don't disappear, um, fortunately, because um, there's a lot of terrific ones. So here's a, a couple of questions from um, youth climate activists. So uh, Tim Root, I'm, I'm gonna ask them both, they're slightly different, but Tim Root asks, what, what impact could youth climate activists have to counter the view of some Americans that climate action could challenge the American, America way of, American way of life? Um, and, and Naomi, I think this actually goes back to a point that you raised um, earlier. So it might be great if you could pick this up. There's another question that's related um, from Nick Hubeck, who's with the Youth Climate Activist with Fridays for Future. Which actors and which decisions should the, cli the global climate move it, movement focus on in the upcoming months? So I think these are, are questions from uh, younger viewers on here, kind of what we should be focused on. And here's another one. And, and, and is from uh, an LSE master's student uh, for environmental policy, Marie Munch, who asks, um, tough question here, how can we ensure that not only necessary policies, like for example, a carbon tax, there are a lot of questions about carbon tax are put in place, but also at a sufficient level. So current carbon taxes are far too low and more effective policies are needed. And of course, this is an argument that is being made certainly in the US, but elsewhere on the left. So three different questions. And, and um, I mean, you're all welcome to kind of jump in on these. Um, maybe we'll go in reverse order here and we'll start with Naomi first this time. Okay, well, I think I can jump in on the American way of life piece because that's something I've thought about a lot because too many people see climate change as a question of sacrifice. And I think we have to crush that narrative and replace it with a positive narrative about technological progress. The United States has a long and proud history of being a leader in technology. Much of that technological advance was done through government action or public-private 
partnership. Uh, Mariana Matsukato's work on this is really important. I think historically very robust. And we know that a big part of the climate problem can be addressed with appropriate green technologies. And as we've already said, those technologies can generate good jobs that can't be outsourced or can't be easily outsourced. So I think we have a very positive message to say, and we need to do more to get that message out. Uh, in my experience giving public talks, Americans are very sympathetic to the argument that we Americans have always known how to roll up our sleeves and get to work. And that's what this is about, right? Getting to work, putting people to work and fixing this problem. Um, the only thing I might diverge from some of the other speakers, and this is a great panel, and I've learned so much listening to all these people, both today and in the past. I want to slightly diverge for something that Professor Slaughter said. Um, she characterized the current conservative judges as pro-business and anti-regulatory. I totally agree that they're anti-regulatory. I don't believe that we should talk about them as being pro-business. You know, whether they are or they aren't is to me a bit of a moot point. I mean, they're pro-certain businesses and they're not supportive of other businesses. We know the fossil fuel industry is massively subsidized. So um, there's a lot of complexity there, but I just think we should drop the language of calling them pro-business because calling them pro-business makes it sound as if we're anti-business and we're not. And Marie, I'm gonna let you respond, but I'm hoping you'll segue to one of the other questions here, maybe to pick up um, which actors and which decisions, you know, um, should the climate, the global, the global, not US, but global climate movement really be focused on right now? Yeah. So I first place, Naomi, I, I take that actually it's a, it's it's very important because and it's not true. <laughs> I mean, you know, there are plenty of businesses that are are plenty supportive of, of this kind of work at work and at many others. So so uh, I stand corrected. Um, so one quick thing just to back up Naomi on on the American way of life. And I think this is a, an argument for the left more generally. Uh, the left has managed to allow the right to capture the whole idea of patriotism and love of country. Uh, and that's crazy. Uh, there's a whole long tradition of loving your country and cr criticizing it and holding it to its highest ideals. And here, you know, I was just thinking as you were talking about sort of the various American songs like, oh, beautiful for spacious skies. I mean, there is there is deep love of the land and love of nature all over uh, sort of traditional American uh, myths and songs and ways of life. So worth, worth finding that and not flinching at the idea that that's part of loving your country. But I did also want to address the question about carbon, the carbon tax, because when I used to teach uh, at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, I used to teach the, the intro course on the politics of public policy. And the first problem we would give the students is, okay, you know, you're, you're advising a new president uh, and he wants to, or she wants to know what to do about climate and there are three options. There's cap and trade, there's regulation, and there's a carbon tax. And all the students would say, carbon tax, carbon tax, that's clearly, you know, going to have the greatest impact. And then you'd say, well, yeah, great. You're here to get things done, not to know what the best thing to do is, and the carbon tax is dead in the water. I don't think we should accept that analysis. And again, I would point people uh, to the, the uh, Climate Action Leadership Council, mm -hmm. where you have a, a lot of uh, Nobel laureates, members, former chairs of the Fed, really heavily, much more heavily conservative folks saying, if you design a carbon tax right with this carbon dividends element, you get the incentives right on climate while also stimulating the economy. So am I, I mean, I am not a cl uh, climate activist studying the, the exactly where the policy wins are, but I think Americans are ready for big, bold ideas. And this is one I would at least start with. Great. Laurence, you want to go? Yeah. Um, one, just uh, some things that can resonate for these youth climate activists, which were so useful to push, uh, in particular, the European policy forward. And I can tell the shift of Germany for in favor of the Green Deal is largely due to the Friday for Future movement. So uh, it's a time for probably this youth movement to do poly some kind of politics in a way. And uh, there is, of course, this notion of 
And Naomi spoke about the love for nature, which is something linked to, because we have to bridge this identity politics, which are so polarized now, and not, not only in the US, but more globally. And that's, of course, these young people are, are confronted with this negative reaction um, on this, uh, you are in a culture that is not ours, and that they have in a way to, in a way, feel how they bridge, they need to bridge to others. And nature and, and even sovereignty, I think taking back control, which is something which of course resonates with Brexit, but climate change is certainly one issue where, and it's that of course for environment protection as well, if you want to take back control of your lives, uh, so you have to put your sovereignty in, in a different place. So I think that's something that the, the in a way linked to the, the connection with territory with where you live in, uh, that can help maybe the youth climate activists just to connect with a fragmented sort of piece of the population, the part of the population that are not, that feel that they are enemies and they are not. By the way, and I, I like, just didn't want to forget that Naomi is right. At one point in time, you have to be, and Joe Biden has to be the strong man saying, I want that. He can't be just accommodating and compromising uh, because that was what Trump uh, in a way succeeded in. I, I know what I want, whatever it was, and whatever we think about that. But I think uh, sometimes if you if you are very clear in what you want to achieve, uh, that, that's useful. I, I do think that in the, in the uh, as uh, Anne-Marie says, I think the, the now we should not have a theoretical discussion of policy instrument. It's no more the time. Uh, in some contexts, the carbon tax is so favored by for many, many reasons where carbon markets are not anymore. We have a, a new discussion in EU now, uh, again, relying on that instrument. By the way, it was US origin and now you have totally, it was totally transferred to EU. It's funny to see that. But I think the combination of, of policy instrument is, is, uh, is what happening every time. And so um, I think that's I, I think that's why the battle of this uh, Friday for Future could be, uh, you can have specific targets now to move for electrification of transport. Uh, you want clean air and you, you have the right to ask for clean air. And it's not only for the, the rich uh, zone in urban areas, but it's for everybody. And that's the same for health in food which I understand, I stopped there, that it's super sensitive in US case, a, a, little, a little less so in Europe. Nick. Uh, I think the, the young people have made a fantastic difference. Um, I come from the generation, I was at the university in the 1960s and we fought on apartheid, on um, Vietnam war and civil rights. And you know, some of the fights took a while to get settled, um, but we were on the right side of history. And I think the, one of the wonderful things of these last uh, five years or so has been how young people have stood up and challenged, and they've challenged again. And it was a long period when university students were really quite quiet, almost boring. <laughs> and now they are not. They're challenging and they're on the right side of history. So keep the challenge and um, challenge on uh, politics, ask for the policies. Of course, the carbon price is part of it, but so is innovation, so is uh, regulation, so is infrastructure investment. Challenge on the finance. There's a very good NGO now that started up this year called Make My Money Matter, led by Richard Curtis, who we know was behind, but one of the key movers in make poverty history press and press and say, look, you've got to put it in the right place. A, because I care about having a good pension and please bet on the future, not on the past. But B, because of, of the morality of the kind of investment I want to be uh, investing in a, in a world I want to live in. And I think that's going to be enormously important. And firms, make public what firms are doing. If they don't shop there, shop there. Don't buy from that place, buy from that place. And that is an enormously powerful thing. And I think that's something that young people can do very well. Finally, on um, patriotism, I think it is just enormously important to successful reform. Clement Attlee was a great patriot. 
he led the most outstanding reformist government the UK has ever seen. And he would not have got there without the deep, deep personal patriotic commitment that he showed and which much of the labor movement showed uh, at that time. And uh, one, one last shot in the direction that Naomi was describing. Um, I also was at university in the years just, just before uh, Woody Guthrie died. And it was Woody Guthrie who wrote, this land is your yeah. land. Yeah? <laughs> this is about America belonging to the people. So we, we actually have, um, we have only four minutes left here. Um, we were gonna kind of go around the horn here and everybody have a closing statement, but I think there's, there, are, uh, there are still questions coming in and I'm gonna put two questions to you and let each one of you very quickly choose what you wanna respond to. One comes from uh, Jonathan um, Tarefi, uh, an MSc student um, here at LSE in Environment and Development. And the question is, um, you know, the conversation so far has given a lot of talk, a lot of mention to, quite rightly, to the US, the EU, China, India, Japan, and South Korea. How can we integrate as part of the global dialogue and incentivize the global South, which will largely bear the burden of climate change, to take more ambitious steps and set higher climate targets going forward? And then just a second question, and I'm thinking, Nick, maybe you could start us off in reverse with that question. Another question also from a, an undergraduate, a BSc student here at LSE in environmental policy um, and economics, Alexa Bochamp. Bochamp. Um, what importance would you put on environmental education uh, in our times? And, and what should, I think, what should be done here in a time where we see a great attitude behavior gap between consumers and even climate activists. So something about education, but also perhaps let's talk a little bit more broadly about the global South and what can be done to incentivize them. And that all in three minutes. So we're gonna start with Nick and then we're gonna to go to Laurence and then we're gonna to go to Naomi and Anne-Marie is gonna get the last word and then I'm gonna close it out. Uh, on the global south, it's about investing in development. Sustainable development is development. Unsustainable development takes you to poverty in the uh, short, medium, and the long run. So what do we do to help? Uh, particularly around the finance that is necessary for sustainable infrastructure, helping with the technology that works for sustainable infrastructure. That means energy, transport, water, and communications. The uh, Global South will be the parts of the world investing most strongly in infrastructure in the coming years and working with them on the science and the technology to help promote development is absolutely uh, fundamental. That's great. Uh, Laurence. Uh, very quickly, I think the first thing in a way it's make all these leaders and the citizen in the global south understand the severity of the impact they are facing. Because again, it's sometimes abstract, even if on the ground they feel it already. So I would say uh, really develop a common understanding on the risk and on the impact. The second thing, of course, is to associate all of the tools we have. Again, we have talked we have spoken about the debt is really be a very central issue in the next two or three years. And the global south in many cases, some so the poorest countries may have access to a debt cancellation. It would not be the case for the uh, middle, middle income countries and that a big, a big issue for them. So combination with finance technology, as Nick said, plus opening our markets for uh, the sound, the sound production, the sound products, the global value chain that are really valuing on the ground the protection environment is really important. I'm, I'm really happy to see that in the Brazilian case, the global companies together with the Brazilian companies are in a way fighting to just stop the deforestation policy uh, with the promise of the market and when the market instrument can incentivize this and support the actors in the global south that want to change because there is no way out. We have really to support them and to, com to combat this uh, pessimism or there is no alternative to growth and a, a very, a very 
energy intensive and nature intensive uh, development that finally is blocking their own environment. Naomi. Well, I think that this, this whole conversation highlights that the challenge is different in different places and the kinds of work we need to do and the kinds of messaging we need to do will not be the same in the United States as they will be in India or China. I think in the United States, since that's where I live and that's where I work and that's what I worry the most about, the most important thing for us now going forward is to make it clear that we are pro-business, we are pro-environment, we are pro-justice, and we are pro-people. And Marie? All right, it's hard, hard I, I'm gonna reinforce that. Uh, in, when we talk about gender equality and how you achieve gender equality, we often talk about gender mainstreaming so that this is not just a women's issue, this is in every issue. And really building on what Naomi just said, that's where I would leave this. In we've just talked about how climate is essential to our future health. Climate is essential to economic growth. Climate is essential to justice uh, in terms of, of bearing those burdens uh, similarly. Uh, and so what we need to do is stop talking about climate as this thing that you study and is for experts. It's for all of us all the time. That's a terrific way to end it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great pleasure to have the opportunity to, to listen to our distinguished panelists today. My colleague, Robert Faulkner, and I want to thank all of you for, for joining us, Emery, Laurence, Naomi, and Nick. Um, many, many thanks for um, taking the time uh, today to share your thoughts about the implications of the U.S. presidential election for international climate politics. I'm sure, uh, you know, our viewers found them as helpful and constructive and even hope as hopeful as I did. To everyone from all of us at the Grantham Institute and the U.S. Center at LSE, stay healthy and stay safe.